Therefore, it's time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, to the Acting Premier, this government has handed out $1.4 billion from the Ministry of Economic Development, 80 per cent which went to companies that either didn't apply or told the application was simply a formality. That's $1.1 billion handed out to Liberal friends. What happened to the government that rode in on a white horse promising openness and transparency? Mr. Speaker, does the acting Premier believe it's acceptable to hand out a billion dollars without an application process? Simple question. Is that acceptable? Yes or no? Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I know the minister will want to take sup, um, supplementary questions, but I do want to say thank you to the Auditor General for her report. Uh, it's a very important part of our democratic institution that we have the Auditor General uh, give us advice on what we need to do to make government better for the people of this province, Speaker. And I was very pleased that the, aid, uh, the Auditor General herself noted that um, the actions we've taken on our, on our follow-up audit, uh, audits. She said, I'm pleased, she said she's pleased to report that 76 per cent of these actions have either been fully implemented or were in the process of being uh, implemented. And she went on to say, I want especially to note the exemplary performance of the Ministry of Education, Ontario Power Generation, Service Ontario, and the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care yes, in implementing rec uh, recommendations from audit two years ago, Speaker. I look forward Thank to the you. supplementary. We take this seriously. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again to the Thank acting you, premier, this government will not ask for receipts. First, it was millions of dollars to teachers' unions. Next, it's bailing out private companies for snowplows. Now we find out that after handing out billions of dollars in the name of economic development, this government can't prove they've created a single job. This government can't prove a single dollar return on their investments. They can't prove it because they never studied the economic impact. All the minister does is write a check, stage a photo op, then forgets the company exists until the next time he needs to send out a press release. Mr. Speaker, why can't the Liberals prove one job was ever created? Was it because this was simply an opportunity Order. to hand out checks to their friends. That's not helpful. <laughs> Minister. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. I want to share two numbers, Mr. Speaker, with the Leader of the Opposition. 145,000 jobs created or retained in this province the since from 2004. 145,000 Ontarians working today because we've had the courage to partner with our business sector. 145,000 jobs that if you and your party had their way, and uh, I'm not going to allow shouting matches to go back and forth. And the member from Leeds Grenville, in case he didn't hear me, I asked him to come to order because he was continuing to shout. And I, I hope the minister gets the message too. Nice and easy. Mr. Speaker, I'm just responding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the. Uh the fact of the matter is we've had $26 billion of private sector investment since 2004 that's flowed into this province. And, Mr. Speaker, the party opposite has opposed every one of them. Well, I, 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 I will take the exercise. The member from Leeds Granville, second time. The member from Dufferin Caledon, come to order. Finish, please. We've had the courage, Mr. Speaker, to make these investments. 145,000 Ontarians, jobs retained or created in this province, jobs that that party, Mr. Speaker, would Answer. like to see in Mexico, would like to see in the Deep South, would like to see. That's enough. Uh, the member from Leeds Granville is warned. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker. Bradgate. Bradgate. Mr. Speaker. 
again to the acting premier or to the minister of handouts. Minister the last of Culture time, and the Liberals got caught with a slush fund. It turned out that they were handing over checks to companies run by lifelong Liberals and Liberal staffers. Mr. Speaker, can the acting premier verify how many of these companies received that received these grants donated to the Liberal Party, or was there an expectation they would donate after they receive a grant? So a very clear and direct question: Did any of the companies that received these grants also donate to the Liberal Party before or after? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, here are the jobs that that party and that leader are opposing. 5,000 high-tech jobs within the next 10 years in the GTA through Cisco. You oppose that. 4,000 jobs in Alliston for Honda retained, Mr. Speaker. They oppose that. 8,000 jobs in Guelph through Linamar. They oppose that. 3,000 jobs at Oakville through Ford, Mr. Speaker. They oppose that. 7,500 jobs in Cambridge. They oppose that. 800 jobs in Napanee through Goodyear, Mr. Speaker. They oppose that. We are partnering with businesses to grow this economy in a fiercely competitive global economy. We have the courage to make those investments. Clearly, they don't. 145,000 Ontarians have jobs or have had their jobs retained as a result of these yes, investments. Mr. Speaker, we're proud of these investments. We're going to continue to grow this economy in spite Thank of you. the opposition. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, again to the acting premier, and since the Minister of Economic Development will not answer whether there is donations to the Liberal parties after these grants, I'm going to try a different angle. The Minister of Economic Development has doled out $1.4 billion through grants to Ontario businesses. Last week, the Auditor General, to use her words, the government gave most of the money to companies it had chosen with no public competition. She told us there was no criteria on how they were picked. That sounds an awful lot like the Colgate slush fund scandal that cost the member from Eglinton Lawrence his cabinet job. Mr. Speaker, is the Auditor General correct? Did the government give out grants with no criteria or competition? Is this Bradgate? Thank you. Thank you. you see the case? You see the case? Thank you. Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Economic Development, Trade, Employment, Infrastructure. Me Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Let me share with you some of the uh, some of the investments that we've made across this province that the members opposite actually have taken an interest in, despite the fact they and their leaders don't support it. In Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, Mr. Speaker, a regional economic development fund provided nearly two million dollars, leveraging 15 million dollars and creating or sustaining 400 jobs. Mr. Speaker, the members of the party opposite talk about not supporting these funds, but when it comes to their own writings, they're very supportive. Perth Wellington. I received a letter from that member, Mr. Speaker, requesting Southwestern Ontario development support for a business in his writing. On November 7, 2012, the member for Simcoe Gray wrote me, requesting funding for his riding through the Southwest Ontario Answer. Development Fund. On October 22nd. Order, please. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order. The leader of the third party come to order. Finish, please. Bruce Gray Owen Sound wrote me asking for, for, for funding for a local airport through the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. The member for Wellington Halton wrote Answer. me, Mr. Speaker, and said some very glowing things about the importance of this fund. Mr. Speaker, the Thank fact you. of the matter is you can't have it both. Mr. Speaker, again to the acting premier and to the minister of slush funds. This government picked companies to receive. The member knows or should know that's not appropriate. Withdraw, please. Withdraw. Finish. The government picked companies to receive grants. Stop the clock. Goes both ways. I want attention for questions and answers. Please finish. 
This government picked companies to receive grants behind closed doors for the purpose of press release politics. The Auditor General Member told us East York. that 80% of the investments were made through unadvertised and non-transparent processes. She told us that only selected companies were invited to apply. That sounds like the minister was just calling up his friends and making them an offer they couldn't refuse. Mr. Speaker, can the acting premier explain Question. why it's appropriate to hand out multi-million dollar checks with no competition? This wouldn't fly anywhere Thank in Ontario. You. Why does it fly with this government? Thank you. I, uh, uh, the member for Renfrew come to order a second time. I'm not standing up for you to get a cheap shot in when I get quiet. That's going to stop. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is the process for consideration of the allocation of these funds is among the toughest processes anywhere in the world today. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, one out of a hundred of the companies that have requested funding under, this, uh, under these proposals actually get through the very tough criteria to get there. Mr. Speaker, any company in this, in this, in this province, in this country, anywhere in the world globally can simply go onto our website and contact our ministry to get into consideration of these funds. So what the Leader of the Opposition is saying, Mr. Speaker, is unmitigated nonsense. These funds are open to any company to apply to, but Mr. Speaker, we need to use these funds strategically to grow jobs. Thank you. 145, Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, again, to the acting premier, I will trust the Auditor General's yeah. report ten times out of ten over the spin of this Minister of Economic Development. Within the $1.4 billion given away by the ministry, there was a noticeable lack of funding for forestry and mining projects. If you actually want to engage Deputy in House economic Leader. development, maybe you could do it in a part of the province that needs it. There was a noticeable lack of funding for Northern Ontario. Yeah. I guess the Premier or the Minister didn't seem to want to invite Northern companies Minister to of apply. Education. The Ministry hasn't funded a Northern project for economic development through this fund since 2008. Mr. Speaker, why did the government ignore Northern Ontario? Was it because there was no liberal friendly companies in Northern Ontario. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, we have a Northern Ontario Heritage Fund that continues to invest. The member from uh, Simcoe Grave come to order and the uh, member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Finish, please. And that fund, Mr. Speaker, continues to make investments in the North. And, Mr. Speaker, our Northern members have done a tremendous job in supporting the North. But the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, I ask the Leader of the Opposition, take a look to the members on his right, take a look to the members on his left, take a look around them. Not one of those members supported the $2.6 billion that we've invested to leverage $26 billion of private sector investment and create or retain 145,000 jobs in this province. That Leader of the Opposition has a tendency to change his mind from time to time. Are you with us in creating those 145,000 jobs, or are you with your Answer. colleagues, Mr. Speaker, who have opposed our efforts to build this economy and create jobs every step of the Thank way? You. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the acting premier. Can the acting premier tell Ontarians why she thinks Hydro One does not need public watchdogs? Good question. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker. And. Um, you know, I think we've had this debate uh, in this House many times. What we are committed to, Speaker, is building the infrastructure that this province needs, Speaker. And if you talk to municipal leaders across the province, if you talk to businesses across the province, if you talk to labour organizations whose members will be put to work because of these investments, you will all hear that we need to make the investments in infrastructure. We do have assets, Speaker. We are prepared 
to, uh, uh, to get the maximum value for those assets so we can build new assets that are needed for today and Answer. tomorrow. Speaker, that's an important initiative of this government, and we will continue to do it in a thoughtful, responsible Thank way. You. Ontario's Auditor General says that the government is keeping Ontarians in the dark about hydro costs. She says there's a lack of transparency and the government isn't being upfront about why hydro costs so much. Now the Liberals, of course, are selling off Hydro One, and that's going to push bills even higher, Speaker. And instead of more oversight so that Ontarians get all the facts, the Premier is shutting every public watchdog out of Hydro One. Can this acting premier explain how getting rid of public oversight will help what the auditor calls a lack of transparency? Wow. Mr. Energy. Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with respect to uh, the new uh, broadened uh, Hydro One, uh, in terms of uh, how accountable they are to the public. Uh, one of the first things they were able to announce, Mr. Speaker, uh, was that the timely issuance of accurate bills is the highest that has been in the history of Hydro One at a success rate of 99.8 per cent, Mr. Speaker. In addition, the number of customers currently experiencing delayed buildings has been reduced to 340 as of June from the peak of over 50,000 during the height of the uh, bill, uh, billing issues, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in addition, wow. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the present Hydro One uh, under, under new management has a new CEO, has a new CFO, has a new chair of the board, Mr. Speaker, and uh, they are extremely, extremely sensitive to uh, serving the public wow. and Answer. putting customers first. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, how ironic. The minister gets up and lays all of these numbers out, and he knows darn well that there is no opportunity whatsoever, forever, for independent verification of what he says in the House, because they took all of the watchdogs out of Hydro One. The government likes to go on and on, for example, and see that the OEB will protect the public interest. Speaker, I'd like to direct the Acting Premier's uh, attention to page 219 of the Auditor's Report, where it says, quote, the OEB, the protector of consumer interests, was not consulted about the sell-off of Hydro One. Wow. Can the Acting Premier explain why this government is doing everything in its power to limit public oversight of Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board, uh, in addition to uh, uh, controlling the rates, Mr. Speaker, uh, also uh, checks on the reliability factors, Mr. Speaker, the efficiency factors uh, of Hydro One. Uh, indeed, Mr. Speaker, for those LDCs which Hydro One remains, Mr. Speaker, they have increased the fine for non-compliance to one million dollars per day, Mr. Speaker. Should Hydro One not be compliant in terms of reliability or under other, any other service requirements, Mr. Mr. Speaker, there's tremendous accountability. There is a new ombudsperson, ombudsman in place, Mr. Speaker, who will report directly to the board and who can appeal to the Ontario Energy Board uh, any particular. Uh, individual who complains, Mr. Speaker. So there is there is accountability. There's accountability under the securities legislation, Answer. which requires disclosure of salaries of senior managers, Mr. Speaker, and many other accountabilities, Thank you. which I'll deal with later, Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the acting premier. I have some other questions about the Auditor General's report. She said. Her, quote, significant concerns were over the fact that, quote, in the context of the federal election campaign and the verbal exchanges between the Premier and the Prime Minister and the fact that the advertising campaign was set to run right up to the federal election voting day, end quote, that she was concerned that this added up to government-funded partisan ads that ran during the federal election. Will this acting Premier tell Ontarians, did Ontario families pay for advertising that was helping the Liberal Party of Canada. Good well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And uh, you, you know that as part of the 2015 budget, we did make changes to the Government Advertising Act, Speaker. We, um, we are very proud that we have banned partisan ads in this province, and now we have clearly defined what a partisan ad is. I think all of us will remember back to the days when the government of Ontario, the taxpayers of Ontario, paid for the then premier of the province to attack teachers on television. I think we remember when, uh, uh, when Mike Harris stood in front of the camera and uh, uh, 
uh, insulted those who teach our students, Speaker. That kind of advertising is not allowed in this province anymore, and I'm very proud of the changes that we have made, Speaker. So you will not see the Premier, will you will not yes, see sir. elected people in, in ads. There are another, other restrictions that we have made so that we do not have government-funded, taxpayer-funded partisan ads. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's a matter of government priorities. In 2013, New Democrats fought to ensure that there was a five-day home care guarantee. Instead, the Premier promised Ontarians a five-day home care target. But now we learn from the Auditor General that seniors are waiting 200 days for home care. We're used to this government missing targets, Speaker, but we're talking about the health of Ontarians' most vulnerable. Will the acting premier tell Ontarians why the government isn't keeping their promise of a five-day home care wait time. long-term care. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I think I missed the two supplementals from the first question, but <laughs> it seems like a completely different question. I'm happy to address uh, the leader, the, thir the third party. So we are making important investments in home and community care, Mr. Speaker. We're making more than $250 million of new investments in home and community care this year, next year, the year after. That's an important commitment as we trans transition uh, Ontarians outside of hospitals or from hospitals, Mr. Speaker, into the home and community where they can be well cared for and where they want to be, quite frankly. So these investments are, are important. The Auditor General, I welcome her report, uh, as I welcomed her report on her CCAC's uh, earlier this year. I've indicated that uh, in the case of the September report, we're going to be implementing all of her recommendations. We accept and we are already working on the recommendations that she's provided. Yes, sir. Update, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Let me tie it all in for the Minister of Health and the Acting Premier and, in fact, the government. The Liberals spent public money on partisan ads to help the federal Liberal Party, so says the auditor. They are leaving seniors waiting 200 days for home care. They are protecting children at risk of child abuse in this province. They're causing energy rates to skyrocket, Speaker, and they're not protecting ratepayers. This is one of the most damning auditor reports I've seen at, at my time at Queen's Park. The Liberals are failing on the fundamentals that people expect of their government, Speaker, while at the same time they're helping their own friends. Yeah. When will this government get its priorities straight? and start working for Ontario families. You see it, please. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. The uh, Minister of Economic Development and Infrastructure Employment will come to order. And the uh, Minister of Health has the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've, uh, as a result of guidance and reports and good advice, including that from the Auditor General, we've already begun to make important changes in our home and community care sector. Sixty percent of those who uh, uh, benefit from home care in this province are seniors, and that's an important yeah. constituency to make sure that we're providing the best possible, the highest quality of care for them. But I find it ironic, this question coming from the leader of the third party, the same party when in government in the 1990s actually delisted home care from OHIP, Mr. Wow. Speaker. And so I'm not going to take lessons from a party that took that move. I'm going to actually look at the advice that we got from experts like Gail Donner and Kevin Smith and others that provided us with advice uh, earlier this year, the Auditor General who provided those important recommendations. We're putting new money into home and community care to make sure that we're taking advantage of innovation yes, and new technologies to provide that highest quality of care that we can that Ontarians deserve. Perfect. Thank you. No question. Member from Lansing, Kent Middlesex. Well, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic development. Speaker, recent, recent reports have come out which raise some serious questions about the lack of judgment, oversight and long-term planning within the Ministry of Economic Development. The Auditor General's report shows that this ministry is handing out taxpayer grants to companies up to $130,000 per job and doesn't even bother to monitor whether those jobs are retained or if the company is providing any economic value to the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this government's own fall economic statement slashed jobs projections by 53,000 positions over the next two years alone. Will the minister admit that his scheme to pick winners and losers and his lack of oversight and judgment is costing Ontario jobs? Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. 
Mr. Speaker, the allegations the member is making are patently false. The fact of the matter is, every contract we get into for every dollar we put out in business supports is, is totally tied to job creation, Mr. Speaker, or job retention, or the investments that the private sector partner is making. And if, Mr. Speaker, they don't comply with their end of the bargain, Either the money doesn't flow, because it often flows in phases, or, Mr. Speaker, it gets clawed back. 94 per cent, Mr. Speaker, of the investments we've made that have, uh, that have helped create or retain 145,000 jobs in this province have met their objectives. That's a pretty good track record. Every one of those agreements comes with full accountability, so the member's allegations are patently false, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Thank you. member from Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again uh, to the minister. In, esti in estimate committee uh, two weeks ago, the minister reassured myself and other members of our caucus that the ministry had a stringent process for deciding on project funding. Yet the auditor's report clearly shows us that over 90 per cent of companies never submitted documentation to show they even needed taxpayer money. It also highlighted numerous instances of companies closing soon after receiving funding or the government even writing off loans. Mr. Speaker, using taxpayer dollars to hand out big checks to big companies that don't even need them doesn't benefit the people of Ontario. It benefits Liberal politicians who like favourable press releases. Mr. Speaker, how can people trust this government with, it, with, it, with their money when this minister is practising crony capitalism instead of sound economic Question. management? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, we've put into place a very stringent level of accountability, both within the prioritization of these projects, Mr. Speaker, and the, and the amount of information that companies have to share with us before they get approved. Only one in a hundred companies that have inquired through these funds, Mr. Speaker, actually makes it through the screen. We look at everything from whether the company would have made the investment in the first place uh, to the rate of return for taxpayers, Mr. Speaker, to the level of investment that, that goes into productivity improvement, to the level of investment that goes towards innovation, to the level of investment that goes towards exporting. Mr. Speaker, there is probably not a jurisdiction anywhere in North America, if not anywhere in the world today, that has a process, Mr. Speaker, that's that stringent. Mr. Speaker, yes, we'll continue to make these investments. We're going to create jobs in this province. The opposition might not be on side, but workers in Ontario are, Mr. Speaker. The member from Nickelville. Mr. President, my question for the Minister of la Santé. My question is for the Minister of Health. The report from the Auditor General is a stinging indictment that this government's failure to protect our residents in long-term care homes. The Auditor General said that the ministry takes up to nine months to investigate high-risk complaint, which should be resolved in three days. The backlog of critical inspection has more than doubled in the last two years. And the result is that the Liberal government is putting long-term care residents at risk and failing to ensure that their rights are protected. Those are not my words, speakers. Those are the words of the Auditor General herself. After so many warnings, after so many promises to do Deputy better, after so many excuses, how can the minister defend the failures to protect our loved ones living in long-term care? Question. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. To the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I also want to thank the Auditor General for her findings on the long-term care quality inspection programs. Mr. Speaker, we not only take the Auditor General's findings and recommendations seriously, we have accepted all of her recommendations. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we have not only accepted the Auditor General's recommendations, we are already implementing all of her recommendations. We are doing this, Mr. Speaker, because we take Take the safety of our long-term care residents seriously. I'm committed to improving on our performance, and I'm pleased to report that all of our outstanding high-risk complaints, as determined by the Auditor General, have been inspected. Order. Once again, Mr. Speaker, I just want to reiterate Answer. I want the people of Ontario to know initiatives are already well underway to implement Thank you. the Auditor General. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the Liberals are failing some of the most vulnerable seniors in our province and their family who trust 
that the government should be looking out for their well-being of long-term care residents. It should never take months and close to a year to follow up on a high-risk complaint. Those are complaints of sexual harassment, complaints of physical abuse. It should never be the case that a resident actually pass away before the ministry act on their concern. And when complaints increase by 47 per cent, like it is the case in London, yes. this government should not shrug his shoulders and say, all is good. They should figure out what was wrong. When will the minister stop trying to defend the failures of this Liberal government and start standing up for the rights of long-term care residents? Thank you. They that. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, as I said, we not only take the Auditor General's recommendations seriously, Mr. Speaker, we are already implementing those recommendations, and work has been well underway on this. And the reason we are already implementing these recommendations is we do find us finding seriously, we take them seriously, and we are committed to the safety of our long-term care residents. Mr. Speaker, I also want to take the opportunity to thank our frontline inspectors for their work in inspecting our long-term care homes. While we acknowledge we must do better, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that the Auditor General has acknowledged, and I quote, the Ministry's new comprehensive inspection process was an improvement over its previous inspection program and that the inspection process is more ex extensive than those in other provinces. Answer. That said, Mr. Speaker, we must do better and we will do better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from the top, North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le ministre. Thank you. My question is for the Minister of uh, Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. In Paris, will conclude this week on December 11. And while putting a price on carbon has become a priority for countries and jurisdictions around the world, I of course believe that there's more that we need to be doing, acting collectively to deal with the trajectory of climate change. As a physician, I know particularly about the effects on human health of unregulated emissions, water pollution, and air that is slowly being poisoned. I believe there are also economic opportunities for our province if we find, if we find ways to lead in the development of clean technology. Speaker, what is the minister doing to tackle these issues? Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member is absolutely right. Tackling climate change will require more than the efforts of our government to put a price on carbon. I'm with Bill Gates on this and commend him and business leaders around the world for forming an international business coalition called the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. Their goal is to invest a billion dollars in technologies that will help solve the climate change challenge. When this government made the decision to eliminate coal and move Ontario's energy system to cleaner sources of power, our efforts fostered a clean tech sector in Ontario. Ontario now is one of the fastest growing and competitive clean tech sectors in the world, and we've taken a number of measures, Mr. Speaker, that support the growth in this area. The Ontario Innovation Demonstration Fund, the Ontario Emerging Technologies Fund, Advanced Manufacturing Fund are just a few, Mr. Speaker, of the areas where we've worked Answer. in this sector. I'm excited at the, about the growth of Ontario's clean tech sector and the thousands of jobs thank that you. it's creating here in Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your action on this file. In fact, the clean tech industry is a notable economic growth opportunity for Ontario. We are home to about 3,000 clean technology companies that employ more than 65,000 people. Speaker, we are already global leaders in this developing field. Our partnership with clean tech venture capitalists, for example, Tom Rand, has also been beneficial along with the passing of the Green Energy and Economy Act, the most progressive piece of climate change legislation in North America. But the opportunities, Speaker, in this industry for Ontario continue to accelerate. What is this government doing, Speaker, to help our clean tech industry go global? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think the, the member is absolutely right to mention the important contribution that innovators like Tom Rand are making in growing our clean tech sector. I firmly believe that supporting Ontario's clean tech sector will not only help solve climate change, it will also grow a globally competitive clean tech sector here in Ontario. And going global is absolutely crucial to those efforts. 
In our recent trade missions to China, we've helped advance that goal. The Advanced Energy Centre and WaterTap signed important agreements to open doors to deploy Ontario energy and water technologies in China. Canadian Solar signed an agreement worth uh, over $700 million with Chinese officials. That makes the me member from Guelph uh, very happy. Hydrogenics signed agreements to supply fuel cell technology for public transportation buses in China. Mr. Answer. Speaker, we're committed to building a highly competitive clean tech sector in Ontario, and we're committed to taking it global. Thank you. New question, the member from Terry Salmaskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, the Minister has a wide-reaching responsibility to ensure that sound business decisions are made to grow Ontario's economy, overall employment and infrastructure. The Auditor General's report remarked that the Minister has a mandate to cover all of Ontario. The Minister's own mandate letter from the Premier tasked him to support communities still suffering from the global re recession. And listen to this part, particularly in Northern Ontario. Well, Speaker, I guess the ministers missed the mark on this front because the last time his ministry funded a business project in Northern Ontario was 2008. That's so long ago that this minister can't even take credit for it. Mr. Speaker, it's been seven years since this government used the Economic Development Capital Fund to fund a project in Northern Ontario. How much longer do people in businesses of Northern Ontario have to wait? Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. I think I better refer this to the Minister of Northern <laughs> Development and Mines. Thank you. Minister of Northern, Devi Northern Development and Mines. I, I appreciate having the opportunity to respond. May I say, first of all, that I mean, um, our ministry works incredibly closely with the Ministry of Economic Development, Infrastructure and Employment on a number of projects and certainly our long-term vision for the eco economic growth in Northern Ontario. But what we are most proud of is the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, a $100 million dollar fund uh, that has been put in place, raising from $60 million a year to $100 million a year, that over the last 10 years, we've been able to create create or retain over 25,000 jobs, 25, jobs as a result of a private sector uh, capital expansion, public sector projects that have gone in place. The, uh, the member for Perry South Muskoka knows that very, very well, although may I say, he hasn't always been 100 percent supportive of the, of the projects that have even gone. To his own right, despite the fact. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, qualifying for an NOHFC grant does not disqualify Northern Ontario businesses from accessing economic development fund dollars. According to the Auditor General's report, the ministry does not consider Northern companies big enough to warrant funding, nor do they generally fund projects in the important Northern sectors of mining and forestry. What does this mean for Northern Ontario, Speaker? It means that last year, Arkland closed its doors in North Bay. It means Sudbury, Sudbury's unemployment rate rose by 2% last year. and means Cliffs left millions of dollars invested in the Ring of Fire on the table just to get out of Ontario. I would hardly call that economic development, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, will the minister commit to fulfilling the mandate spelled out by the Premier to provide economic development funding to Northern Ontario? Don't freeze out the North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I am tempted to, to uh, give the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry an opportunity to respond because I know what he'd want to say is how pleased he is that uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry is now part of the Jobs and Prosperity Fund for all across the province. A huge uh, uh, commitment from our government, $200 million indeed. And may I say, Mr. Speaker, when one looks at the commitment that we've made on the Northern Highways program, over $5 billion over the last 10 years that's gone to Northern Ontario, the member of Cross there, the, the 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 hall here, whatever. He understands how important that is in terms of economic development uh, all across the north. And again, um, we are so proud. Over one billion dollars over the last ten years invested through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, which has actually leveraged about 3.1 billion dollars in dollars spent on northern projects, whether it's the private sector, which that party actually withdrew from entirely, or the public Thank sector, you. which we continue to support. Thank you. New question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Speaker, last week when I asked about children being placed in homes with people who have a history of child abuse, the minister said she is going to issue another directive. Well, Speaker, if the issue is that directives are not being followed, I have a hard time believing that simply issuing another directive is going to fix these very serious problems. Not to mention the minister claimed that she was surprised by the AG's findings. Speaker, it's the minister's responsibility what's, what's going, to know what's going on in her own portfolio. We need real action to protect our most vulnerable kids in care, not more talk. Will the minister please explain to vulnerable kids how issuing another directive is going to keep them safe? Thank you. Minister Responsible Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, again, I want to say I take the recommendations of the Auditor General very seriously. And uh, while she has noted significant progress since the last audit, I fully recognize there's more work to do. And we are already addressing a number of things with respect to improving the child welfare system. With respect to the registry checks, um, although uh, directives were previously uh, issued. Uh, it is most unfortunate that um, that does not seem to be happening in some cases, and and anything less than that is is not good enough, Speaker. So I'll be instructing boards of all CASs to develop a quality improvement plan regarding a number of issues associated with the Auditor General's report, and uh, I'll be requiring that they supply those plans yes, to the ministry. And if I'm not satisfied with that, there'll be more action taken. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, as you hear from the minister's response, she absolutely has no idea what's going on in this file. The same issues were highlighted in the 2006 Auditor General's report, and they're, they've gotten worse. This government is failing kids in Ontario that are in care. They're placing them with known child abusers, not implementing recommendations that follow the death of child in care, not doing background. You're, you should pay attention. Not doing background checks for people who work with kids in care, closing cases too soon, taking seven months to complete investigations of abuse. Speaker. The ministry needs to, to and the minister need to take responsibility over this file and ensure that they are protecting kids in care in this province, which she has failed to do. Speaker, I take my job extremely seriously as the Minister of Children and Youth Services, and nothing is more important to me or my government than protecting vulnerable children in need of in Ontario, Speaker. And we've taken action, Speaker, and we've developed performance agreements. We're implementing a new computer system, so there's one record for every child in this province. We've introduced performance indicators. And, Speaker, I will be following up on the very specific things the Auditor General talked about last week. How long does it take investigations to be completed? Why are they being reopened? from Kitchener and What's Waterloo. going on with the checking the child registry? These are the questions I'm putting before the child, uh, Children's Aid Societies. I'll be meeting with the Association of Children's Aid Societies uh, a week today, and I'll be taking further action. Thank you. New question, the member from Barry. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Associate Minister of Finance. Minister, my constituents are very pleased to see our government's continued progress on building the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. Many individuals, including my children and their friends, have spoken to me about the challenges they face in saving for retirement and the ways that they will benefit from the ORPP. They know the plan will help ease the anxiety they have about achieving financial security in their golden years. Mr. Speaker, last week's fall economic statement highlighted a number of important steps our government is taking to build a best-in-class plan that will enhance retirement security for Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could you please update the House on the recent progress made in the ORPP? Thank you. Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Barrie for this important question. In the recent fall economic statement, our government announced the appointment of the initial board of directors for the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan Administrative Corporation, which will be a professional and arm's-length entity. The board will be led by Susan Wahlberg Jenna, who will serve as chair, Murray Gold, and Richard Nesbitt. Members of the initial board were recruited based on their expertise, experience, and leadership. Each 
board member brings a diversity of experience in key areas, including investment and asset management, pension administration, legal and regulatory compliance, and financial operations and management. Mr. Speaker, we are very pleased to put in place the strong leadership that will be instrumental to strengthening retirement security yes, for the people of Ontario. Yeah, 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 yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. I know my constituents will be pleased to learn that our government has a highly skilled and experienced initial board at the helm of this very important administrative entity. Mr. Speaker, again, through you to the Associate Minister of Finance, I know the government passed legislation to establish the ORPPAC earlier this spring. This legislation outlined a number of responsibilities of the ORPPAC with regards to administering the plan. In conversation I've had with people in my writing, some people still think that the government will be responsible for managing the ORPP contributions. I know the government has corrected the record on this myth a number of times. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please confirm what role the ORPPAC will have with regards to the administration Question. and implementation of the ORPP? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to once again thank the hardworking member from Barrie for that question. The ORPPAC, as an independent arm's length entity, will be responsible for the administration of the plan for the benefit of the members of the plan. It will be responsible for enrolling eligible employers, collecting and investing contributions, administering benefits, and communicating with employers and members. The board will oversee the startup activities of the administrative corporation. This is central to achieving our goal of ensuring that by 2020, all Ontario workers are covered by the ORPP or a comparable workplace plan. Mr. Speaker, we believe that after a lifetime of hard work and contributing to the economy, Ontarians deserve a secure retirement. Here, here. I am confident that these individuals, with their skills and expertise, will be able to help millions of Ontarians yes, achieve just that. Here, here. Here, here. Your question, the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> my, uh, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, you continue to have a crisis in corrections. Mm -hmm. Last Wednesday, inmates at the Toronto South Detention Centre ignited several fires, throwing fireballs at officers and setting cells afire, causing five correctional officers to be hospitalized and dozens of staff treated for smoke inhalation. Smoke filled all ten floors of Tower A. To quote a reliable source, we were very fortunate that no one died in the incident. Minister, <clears throat> emergency safeguards were not working. The building automation system appeared to be inactive. The fire suppression system, while being reset, prevented the Toronto Fire Service from responding immediately. Fast-acting staff had bypass management delays to rescue and separate inmates. Speaker, can the minister finally take the situation seriously and put in place management that will respect the staff and inmates Thank and you. enact required safety protocols? Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And, uh, Speaker, I do want to thank uh, our, our entire correctional staff, both the management and uh, correctional officers, who work extremely hard every single day. And in that particular instance, uh, they made sure that all safety protocols were, were followed to make sure that nobody uh, was seriously uh, seriously hurt. Speaker, that is why we, we of course, focus so much on, on training and ensuring that when incidents like these uh, occur that as they could occur in any large facility that there is appropriate steps that are taken immediately to ensure that both to say to protect the health and safety uh, of uh, our correctional staff but also that of, of inmates and in this particular instance speaker I thank uh, uh, all our correctional staff both management and correctional officers uh, for the for the right uh, steps they took to ensure that the facility is safe yes, and inmates and staff are safe as well. Thank you. Thank you, Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Back to the Minister. Speaker, ticking time bombs continue to explode at TSDC. Late November, an officer had a harrowing experience. The officer had just stepped into the elevator when she was thrown into darkness with a power failure that caused the elevator to drop three floors with great speed and then suddenly stopped. The elevator doors didn't open as they should have in a power failure. Instead, the elevator dropped further. 
The officer was quite shaken and could only think that the elevator would plummet the entire 10 stories. Speaker, the minister's government is not taking these issues seriously. Instead of doing the right thing, they put a gag order on staff so the public does not hear these horror stories. Speaker, when will the minister do his job Question. and get this place fixed up to the standards it was designed to be at? Thank you. Well, well, Speaker, let me, Speaker, let me make it very, absolutely very clear that uh, I and this government take our job extremely seriously. And when it comes to the health and safety of our correctional staff and that of inmates, uh, there's nothing more important uh, element that, than that. And that is why, Speaker, we make appropriate uh, 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 investments in training. In fact, Speaker, as you, as I mentioned before in this House, uh, our big focus is around transformation of correctional services. Just last Friday, Speaker, we hired another, uh, hired and trained another 92 uh, correctional officers. They came uh, through our, our college, uh, Speaker, which are being dispersed Answer. all across the province, Speaker. That brings the total of hiring in last two years to 571 new correctional officers, and we'll be hiring more with appropriate training, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. On Wednesday, we learned that the Liberals' freeze on, freeze on hospital funding will force St. Joseph's Hospital, St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton, to cut a staggering $26 million from next year's budget. There is no way to cut another $26 million from the hospital's budget without hurting patient care. And on Friday, we saw only the first sign of these deep cuts when we learned that the seven-bed mental health unit will be shut down and 12 full-time jobs will be eliminated. It's just the start of deep cuts to the health care services that families in Hamilton rely on. Will this Liberal government do the right thing and stop the $26 million cut to St. Joseph's health care and start supporting mental health services instead of cutting them, Speaker? Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I appreciate the question because it allows me to provide uh, additional clarity to the decision that has been made by St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton. And, and, and to start off, Mr. Speaker, it's important to note very specifically that the beds in question remain fully available to the health care system on a go forward okay. basis, okay. Mr. Speaker. These beds will be re added to the system as patient demand rises, Mr. Speaker, and also if there becomes a need in acute or in long-term care within the hospital, these beds can and will also be made available for that purpose. So the greater flexibility with regards to these uh, beds in question, uh, which will remain available, actually will allow the hospital to provide the uh, important care for the individual that needs it at yes, that sir. moment in time, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this government is squeezing the hospital and putting them between a rock and a hard place when it comes right. to patient care. The Liberals talk a good game about mental health, but here's what people see. Forced by the Liberals to cut, cut $26 million, St. Joe says it's entering a period of, quote, extreme cost restraint, and frontline health care workers say they are, quote, being crushed by these provincial funding cuts. We all know that the most vulnerable patients and their families will pay the price for deep health care cuts. It means longer wait times and more stress for workers. But the Liberals don't seem to care, Speaker. When will this Liberal government wake up to the damage that it is causing, do the right thing for families, and put a stop to these deep cuts to frontline health care in Hamilton and right Question. across the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, in fact, in the last decade, we have in we in Hamilton alone, we've increased the number of mental health beds, forensic mental health beds, by 42% wow. in that location alone. And our investment province-wide in mental health has almost doubled from half a billion dollars to a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. We're absolutely committed to, men to mental health and addictions programs and support. We're increasing that uh, on an annual basis, Mr. Speaker. And and in fact, I think the member opposite would agree that. 
often outcomes are better within the community. And so supporting those community mental health organizations and the beds that they provide is also important. We've increased that amount significantly to $62 million in Hamilton. We've opened 498 new beds in Hamilton, Mr. Speaker, and redeveloped an additional 224 beds Answer. in Hamilton in the last decade. Sometimes the community is the best place to take care of these individuals and provide the supports that they need. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question this morning is for the Minister of Transportation. Quite often in this House, we speak about the importance of transit for those living in our communities. In my own community of Davenport, using transit is a way of life. We use it to get to work every day and back home to our families in the evenings. But, Mr. Speaker, transit is not only an important mode of transportation for those living in my community, it is also a critical instrument that we can use as a government to help combat climate change. Mr. Speaker, I know the minister recently made an important announcement about the gas tax program. Can the minister please tell members of this House more about this announcement and how it will positively impact the environment? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the outstanding member from Davenport for her question, for her championing, for her community, and for her, her advocacy, Speaker. It's a very important question. She's 100 percent right, Speaker. Just a number of days ago, I was in Durham to announce that our government—yes, Durham, Durham, which includes the wonderful communities of Whitby and Ajax and Pickering and other Speaker, and Clarington and Bowmanville. I was happy to be there to announce that our government is providing Ontario municipalities with over $332 million in gas tax funding this year. That's $11 million more this year, Speaker, versus last year. Our gas tax program, Speaker, helps eligible municipalities improve and expand their transit services. Specifically, it allows them to increase accessibility, buy more transit vehicles, add more routes and extend hours of service, making it easier for people to use public transit and make Answer. greener choices. Last year alone, Speaker, there was an increase of more than 217 million passenger trips on municipal Thank transit you. systems compared to 2000. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his response. I know that uh, those living in my community will be glad to hear that our government is both investing in Ontario municipalities and helping the environment through the gas tax program. But, Mr. Speaker, we know that there is always a risk that transportation-related emissions could increase if we do not help Ontarians make greener choices. My community of Davenport wants to know that our government is committed to making those investments in transit and transportation that will help protect our environment. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please tell members of this House what other investments our government is making to help us reach our sustainability targets? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. I thank the member from Daven for Davenport for her follow-up question. Our government is committed to making those crucial investments that support GHG emissions, Speaker, uh, reduction, Speaker, through the use of public transit and other congestion-reducing measures. That's why we continue to deliver on this province promised by investing in transit to get cars off our roads. Whether it's added go service on the Kitchener Line speaker from Mount Pleasant to Union Station, which will turn more drivers into transit users, or through important initiatives like Cycle On, which are helping to reduce emissions and keep Ontarians active. We've also introduced the Electric Vehicle Incentive Program and the Electric Vehicle Charging Incentive Program, which are helping drivers make a more environmentally friendly decision when purchasing a vehicle. Mr. Speaker, our government knows how important public transit is to managing congestion, which is why we will continue to make those investments yes, that will make a positive impact on our environment. And I thank the member from Davenport for her advocacy on behalf of her thank constituents. You. The member from yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. This morning, the Transportation Minister unveiled his Liberal government's latest plan to dig into our wallets to pay for their failures. This time, they're doing it on the backs of Ontario motorists, Deputy asking House us Leader. to pay again for the privilege Second of driving time. on our own roads. The minister can frame it whatever way he Sorry, wants as to Lord. motorist options, but when it comes down to it, the lanes he is designating for tolls are the same lanes taxpayers have already paid for. Minister, why are you making Ontarians pay twice to drive on roads that we've already paid for? Double dip, Thank you. Minister of Transportation. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that I made the announcement about two hours ago. It's unfortunate that the member from Kitchener Conestogo didn't take the time to actually look at the announcement itself, Speaker, and would rather, as is typical for that member and for that Conservative Party, play politics with an important issue. Speaker. Chair, what I announced this morning, Speaker, is that no general purpose lanes in the provincial highway network will be removed or converted in order to deliver on our HOT plan. Speaker, that means that any individual who currently drives in an HO in a general purpose lane will continue to have that opportunity going forward, Speaker. At the same time, anybody who chooses to carpool, Speaker, will be and that's carpooling with two or more people in the vehicle, will be able to use the HOT lanes just as they can currently use HOVs for free, Speaker. What this announcement is all about today, Speaker, is making sure yes, that sir. motorists across our region have more options to, to alleviate the congestion challenge that we have in the GTHA and across the province. Our Order. government, under our Premier, has a plan to move the province forward. Thank I'd you. love one day to hear the Conservative plan. Thank you. Well, Speaker, it may, be, it may be the QEW today, but we all know we'll be seeing HOT lanes on our 400 series as the minister pushes his latest revenue tool down our roads. Government. The minister may yes. want to boast about their hot lane bling, but Ontario residents shouldn't have to pay for it. Speaker, in the last year, we've been told the Wynn Liberal Transit Plan will be funded by everything from the Hydro One sell-off to green bonds. Today, we're told it's hot lanes, but we all know when the tolls start rolling in, they'll be headed to pay for government mismanagement and excess. Will the minister guarantee us today that not one cent of these highway tolls will pay for anything other than transit? Good question. Thank you. Thanks for well, Speaker, as I said this morning uh, when I made the announcement, I'll be back in the spring with an update regarding the QEW pilot that we're going to be uh, that we're going to be running as opposed as it uh, relates uh, to high occupancy tolls, Speaker. But what's interesting, I think, for everybody here in this chamber, and of course those watching at home, Speaker, is that in his opportunity to stand up in a supplementary and shine, Speaker, and to show the people of his own caucus and to show his leader that, in fact, that member from Kitchener has a plan to build this province up in terms of infrastructure and transit, or that that leader, Speaker, has an opportunity to present a plan for building the province up, that time after time after time, day after day, in this legislature and in talking to media, they refuse to, to talk about what their plan is to move the province forward. Speaker, we're investing in transportation. We're investing in infrastructure. We're putting more choices on the road for service. We're alleviating congestion. We've got the right plan. We've got the right premier. One day, maybe that member will stand up and do the same thing. Member from Prince Edward Hastings. New question. The member from Welland. My question is to the Acting Premier. In the 2015 speech from the throne, the Trudeau government committed to not, and I quote unquote, resort to devices like omnibus bills to avoid scrutiny. Too bad that wasn't the case with the Liberals here, Speaker. Instead, the Liberal government buried what they knew was going to be a problem into their Harper-style omnibus budget bill by introducing conservative legislation that releases a single company, corporate giant Alice Don, from its 60-year obligation to hire unionized workers in this province. Speaker, the thousands of affected trades people here in the province are and should rightly be concerned when the Minister of Labour continually refers to an agreement that was never ratified. Will the Acting Premier strike down the Ellis Don schedule from Bill 144? Trin, thanks once again to the member that's taken such an interest in this issue, as we all are. What we've done with this legislation, Speaker, is address an anonymity, an anonymity, 
anomaly <laughs> that, that impacts a single company and, and no other in this province, Speaker. Uh, what we brought forward is a practical solution, a way of achieving that solution after consultation with the parties that are involved in this, Speaker. In the past, what we would have had go forward is a solution to this problem that would have served the interests of one side but gave nothing to the other side. I think most people in this House agree, Speaker, that if we're going to resolve this issue that's been around since the 1950s, we need to do it in a way that both sides come out of this with something, Speaker. What we put forward in the bill, what I propose to put in the regulation as it moves forward, Speaker, yes, is formed on the basis of what was an, an arbitrator's report to me. I plan to frame the regulation around that arbitrator's report. The member from Windsor to on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, earlier the member from Essex uh, introduced two members of Unifor Local 444 visiting from Windsor. They've been joined by a third. I'd like to welcome Mandy Cardoso here. Welcome to Queen's Park this morning. Time for question period is over. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.